Hi, this is Paul. I want to jump into the first part of the deeper yet into the weeds video with Jordan and Jonathan and John and draw attention to attention. Now, the attention conversation has been happening uh, on and off since Jordan's early conversation with Jonathan Peugeot. And while attention might seem like one of these secular, ordinary things out there, I think central to part of my project here is exploring, let's say, the loss of church in the public sphere. And I think a great deal of this has to do with attention and the relationship between attention and worship. Um, in many ways, to worship something is to attend to it. I was, you know, again, I've been reading James Holland's treatment of the war in the West, and this part of the book is talking about Germans um, under the regime of Hitler. All you have to do today, Erna had told her, is to kneel down and worship Hitler. You don't want any other qualifications for your job of work at all. Now, it's not an unusual word of um, use of the word. It's how we normally use the word. The other, um, the other use of worship in this book. We only seek the right of man to be free. We seek his right to worship his God, to, leave his, to lead his life in his own way, secure from persecution. So again, that's one use seems just sort of normal worship. You know, everyone has to worship Hitler. Well, what do we mean by that? It's everyone has to pay attention to Hitler. Everyone has to do what Hitler says. Everyone has to attend to Hitler, whether that's Hitler directly or on down through the mediating bodies and layers of society. Uh, you find this in the the worship of the Japanese emperor. The worship is, is someone that's at the top of the hierarchy and you have to attend to it. Now, why don't people go to church? This is California. A lot of people don't go to church. A lot of people don't go to church in Europe. I think if you would ask a lot, most people who don't go to church, they probably don't go because, it's not because church is offensive, although some people might find that. It's not because church somehow, it feels wrong to go to church. No, it's just not getting them towards their goal. It's not worth paying attention to. What do we pay attention to? If you ever pay attention to your what your eyes are drawn to, it might be an attractive person, it might be um, clothing that you're paying attention to or thinking about, it might be a car, it might be... All of these things are present to your visual field and something draws your attention. Now, a lot of this attention drawing is unconscious and happens automatically. Again, I've, I've noted many times that I walk into your office, if there's a Bengal tiger or a coiled up snake or the Queen of England, uh, they would immediately draw your attention. There's combinatorial explosiveness in any room that you walk into, but something is narrowing your attention to a particular thing. What disciplined religious worship does is train the attention. Worship is really, in many ways, training. Now, in my conversation with Jonathan Peugeot, I talked about the fact that a lot of people have poor interpersonal skills. Interpersonal skills are something that you learn, you develop, you're certainly taught them by your parents. If your parents had good skills, you probably have pretty good skills because you learned them by your parent. Some people seem better at it than others. And, and we all know this, and we all like spending time with people who are generous listeners, who um, are gracious in many ways, who, who are very skilled at interpersonal communication. We like that. They grab our attention. So, I, I think attention is part of why this conversation in this little corner of the internet I find very interesting is that what we see being crafted in many ways is a, you can look at it either historically 
where why did everyone pay attention to, let's say, religious liturgy? Well, because they, be they believed their, their life depended upon it. Um, I was just reading um, um, Ben Witherington, a New Testament scholar, has a book, A Week in the Life of Corinth. And because I'm preaching through 1 Corinthians, I usually do some background reading. And now Tom Holland has so impacted me that when Ben Witherington puts in the mouth of a first century Greek character, uh, this is a slave of someone who is attending the Corinthian church. This slave keeps talking about the religion of his master. And it struck me when I listened to that, that that wouldn't be, that, that wouldn't, that's, a, that's again, a secular conceptualization. Because part of what we have in the secular world is the conceptualization that there's regular life where we're directing our, our, our attention and our thoughts, where we're directing our attention. And again, part of what we're discovering through cognitive science, through psychology, through a bunch of the conversations that we're having is that this, this little me inside isn't directing that at all. Well, I can to a certain degree. And Peterson, of course, early on had this great video about the people bouncing the ball and you have to count the number of times that the ball bounces and then a gorilla comes in the middle and does a little dance and walks out. And that whole exercise is an exercise about attention. You're paying attention to the bouncing ball and you don't see the gorilla. Now, why should the gorilla be noteworthy? Again, because what you actually have, what you actually are perceiving is an entire field that is filled in many ways with expectations and a gorilla would be anomalous, okay? And so the um, because a gorilla is anomalous, the gorilla should draw your attention because our attention tends to be drawn to anomalies. And so this attention conversation is, is really quite important. And this is not gibberish at all because a big part of understanding what's going on in our culture is we have developed these technologies over the last hundred years and this technological change has only increased to the degree that we are not just paying attention to screens and the things on them or podcasts and the things on them, but the machinery in the attention economy is grabbing us more and more and more and more. And of course, this has a direct impact in the church. In some ways, churches have gotten into this because churches have gone to the world of screens and are, are competing with Netflix and YouTube and, and all, the, all the different things that are out there. But what's important about this attention conversation is it draws our attention to the fact that whatever is directing our attention is certainly formed. And this formation has been going on our whole lives long. And in fact, this formation has been going on for thousands of years. Your culture is full of formations that direct your attention. Example of this, watch movies from the 20s and 30s and look at African Americans or women. When you're watching that film now, because you're tipped off, you'd say, oh, look at the treatment of these African Americans, look at the representation, look at the portrayal. And rightly so, they didn't see that. It's the same film, but when we see it now, we see very different things. And that's true all over the place. And in almost any once you go on to the opposite side of a transformation, especially the opposite side of an apocalyptic transformation, the world you look at is different. And it's hard to demonstrate this to people, but once, in a sense, you've passed through the looking glass, you can't see it, and now we have this no longer naive awareness of just how some of these things work. So this is the this is the first segment of conversation 
in this video. Um, to see the world, we must, must prioritize our perceptions. So, John, I'll ask you about that first. Now, again, part of what we're dealing with in this meaning crisis is what exactly am I? We, we now see mechanisms outside, and then when we look in the mirror, we begin to wonder, are, there, are we just simply the sum total of the mechanisms? Is, am I simply a product of the whole show, as C.S. Lewis calls it? Um, am I simply determined and the experience of personhood and agency is purely illusory because I am locked into my mental processes and the words that have been moving through time and because of the myriad complexity and particularity of me, this is, I'm just going through the motions as, as Sam Harris imagines. Because that's a particular, I believe, a particular focus of yours. I don't think that's an exaggeration. Or no, it's not. That's, that's, that's the, the core of my work. Um, and so um, the main um, way I would respond to this is I would say, um, I think the work that's coming out from artificial intelligence and the work that's coming out from attention lines up with this very well. And he notes that because... We want the machines to pay attention. So I bought um, I bought a new car in 2020, and the car has many of the current safety features. Um, and one of the things that I noted with my car, it has the automatic um, collision avoidance, so it will brake automatically. If you're going around a particular curve, sometimes, whereas I, or, or if a car in front of you is, let's say, is slowing down to turn off, the car will slow down too much. Now, I see the context of the car starting to turn, and I expect that there's another thinking driver in the car, and it will continue to turn. And so I will, in fact, just continue to maintain speed because my expectation is the car will turn. I don't anticipate the car braking, which would cause a collision. But the little seeing eye in the front of my car is just seeing this much and it's just measuring the distance between me and that car and measuring my speed and suddenly I'm driving and whoosh the car is slowing down and then my wife looks at me like why are why, why are you braking I'm so, I'm not braking the car is braking well it's yeah I know it's turning off and you you can have that if you say you're going around a corner and that that little um artificial intelligence sensor that is looking ahead and sees the wall even though I'm turning and Every now and then it'll just get it wrong and boom, the car will break. And um, I was I was looking at Tesla videos the other day and people were talking about this in terms of Tesla, that um, that this happens sometimes in their automatic driving Tesla. So this business of attention, we naturally, and in fact, we unconsciously and unselfconsciously manage many of these things. But that doesn't mean for many of us the unselfconsciousness is unimportant. So I, I today I watched a good bit of Jordan's um, back off his his video about climate change, and I, what I paid attention to in this video was the introduction where. He quite clearly received a message from various people, myself included, that just sort of these angry readings um, might not be the best way to communicate. And so news pieces, let's say commentaries recently, and people have objected. Some people have objected to my tone. I'm often dealing with things that I would say frighten me to take on to some degree. They're big issues and they're contentious. And so a handy source of impetus and power, I mean, motive power in such situations is to harness a certain degree of outrage and anger. That also fuels my spirit. Now, this is, this is a video that I'm sort of waiting to make because I'm really glad that he's talking about this because this, in terms of our current culture war, is a big deal. 
because part of what we do when we signal anger is we signal to other people, even though it's sort of passing through our attention detectors, we're signaling other things to other people. And, you, you know, it's you, you can see it when, um, you know, we now that the gates up and the fences up we've got these ground squirrels all over the parking lot and they're sort of running running amidst but when i walk into the parking lot they shoot and they all go down together so they're watching each other and they're they one sees me and they might yap dogs of course bark and if you've got two dogs one dog starts barking the other pays attention the other will probably just start barking their repeaters and so there's a lot going on here i suppose in some sense when i'm writing these articles it would be easier in many ways just to sit on the couch and, and read a Stephen King novel, but I have to get up the energy. And maybe I do that by relying to an untenable degree on wrath, which is a cardinal sin in some regards. Now, it's not like there's not things that are worth being irritable about, but I thought what I would do today as an experiment is to attempt to read this in the most calm and understanding manner that I can, despite its rather pointed message. And so I'm trying to get the tone right, you know, and I'm paying attention to the feedback I'm getting from friend and foe alike, let's say, and modifying my approach as a consequence. And so this is an attempt to modify it yet again in the hopes of attaining something better. And here we go. And of course, Taylor, vroom. <laughs> no, come on, come on, come on. Uh, but yes, so he's attending to his critics, uh, friend and foe alike. He's attending to the response of the message. He's, he's, he's attending to all of this. And of course, he's attending to the conversation about climate change and shutting down farms. And, and this, he's done a series of videos on this. This is clearly a... Um, when he looks around all of the all of the things in the world for him this area feels salient now of course there's going to be a lot of debate as to I mean people always say things like, well he shouldn't talk about this and it's like because he's not an expert it's like well, you're not an expert either so why are you judging what he's saying I mean you, you just people make decisions um, but he's got a big platform and there should be responsibility and so eh, fair um but anyway, my point is, again, attention. When I watch this video, I've, I've heard his position on climate change. I'm interested in what's going on in farming. I'm going up to Friesland, where my ancestors, at least uh, the ones that I can, the, as far as I can go back, where they all lived, and the Frisian farmers are upset, and given the fact that the Christian Reformed Church in North America is mostly made of the descendants of Frisian farmers. That caught my attention and learned a few things about the um you know some of the some of the ways that the dutch farmers had addressed some of the issues i'd paid attention to the nitrogen cycle back when i read the alchemy of air yada 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 and you can see that attention is constructed from books that i've read in the past experiences that i've had in the past all of these things goes in to govern my attention in a vastly more complex and nuanced and sophisticated way than the little eye on the front of my car tries to keep me from barreling into something ahead of it. Um, I don't have any significant disagreement with that proposition. Because and, and the must part of it as well? Be because because I, I, so the must, I took, well, let me tell you how I took the yeah, must. Yeah. And I took it as what's called constituent. And you can see that paying attention, we not only pay attention to what we hear, then when we're asked, we pay attention to our own selves and this self-transcendence where we sort of step away from ourselves, we look at ourselves, we explain ourselves. I mean, we're very sophisticated creatures. Constitutive necessity. I took it to be, if you are going to be a cognitive agent, then you must do this. I didn't take it to be a metaphysical necessity. I took it to be that kind of constituent yeah. necessity. I which, think it's useful to start with what you describe as constituent necessities before you move into the realm of metaphysical exactly. necessity. Exactly. I think that's a good way to argue. You should, right? And so I think, and I'm not going to re re uh, recapitulate all these arguments, but a, a lot of work, I think, zeroes in on the idea that the core of what makes us intelligent 
And the thing that we're finding difficult to give to machines to make them artificially general intelligence is a, a, a process I call relevance realization, which is exactly, I think, lines up with this very well. The and, and, and again, I mean, we've been living with relevance realization for a while now. It goes sort of both ways. It's... Um, it's it's both relevant. The uh, realization is is always sort of a two sided word, and and so intelligence. If the so so actually we bought a we just wound up buying two cars at the same time, basically because the beginning of the pandemic, kids were coming home from college. What I always did with my kids was I always sell my kids my old cars because I know the history of those cars and they don't get taken, and I give them a good deal on their car and. They have, they have to pay me over time. And, you know, so I, so I sold, I sold cars. One car was basically had repairs that didn't make it worth repairing. And another car I sold to my daughter. So we wind up, wound, and a third car also had repairs that didn't make it worth. So I wound up, we wound up, my wife and I bought two cars. We bought a Hyundai and we bought a Mazda. And both have this adaptive cruise control where you're on the highway and it's, What's the relevance realization? It's the car in front of you. And you can set, well, how many car lengths, yada, yada, yada. Some of you are familiar with this, this kind of technology now. One of the things we noted right away was that the Hyundai was quite a bit more sophisticated. The Hyundai um, accelerated more slowly and braked more slowly. It, it was clear that the Hyundai was a lot smarter than the Mazda. The Mazda would drive, 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 brake, and then zoom. And, you know, the, the Hyundai was a lot smoother back and forth. And so we would we would call this intelligent because it, in a, is it, a, it is, in a sense, paying attention to the correct things and responding in a way that doesn't disturb these soft creatures that are paying all this money to buy these very smart cars. The amount of information available to you in the world is astronomically vast. All the things you could pay attention to. The amount of information in your long-term memory, especially if you think of all the ways it could be combined, is also astronomically vast. Right. The number of... So in other words, even the formation, even in terms of how we are formed over time, not only out of combinatorial explosiveness out there, but all of the experiences, what we're doing as we go through life is we are sifting all of these experiences. Often, you know, my wife and I have been married now 34 years. We will often talk about something in the past and it's quite amazing what I can easily recall and what she can easily recall. We it, it's almost as if, well, we've lived two different lives, even though we have lived two different lives, but we've been together. And so we were together for many of the same experiences. And I will, I will not easily recall certain things, and she will easily recall certain things. And this, of course, goes into uh, the attention that we have for each other and then our perceptions and our models for each other that we walk around with. Options of potential lines of behavior. I could move this finger, this finger. I could move them. I could lift, like you, and the ways I could move around. That's combinatorial explosion. All of it, all of it. And then, right, and then you can also consider, you know, all of the options uh, of different pot of, of potential worlds you might want to consider trying to produce or moving into. Now, again, this isn't, this isn't irrelevant to the question of church. What do you do on Sunday morning? Oh, I sleep in. I putz around the house, uh, watch the news, I go golfing, I, you know, all of these things. What do I do Sunday morning? I go to church. What I do every Sunday morning, I go to church. Why do you go to church every Sunday morning? Why do you go to Bible study on Wednesdays? And, and what do you do in that church? Well, all of the things that you're doing are one way or another, not only the product of your formation, but are contributing to your formation going forward. Let's say, well, the doctor says you really have to uh, get in better shape or, you know, bad things are going to happen to you and you don't want those bad things to happen. So maybe you get a gym membership and then you go to the gym, you go to the gym five or three or five or six or seven days a week and you um, and going to the gym isn't much fun, but you're there for an hour or an hour and a half and you're, you're doing your cardio and you're doing your weights, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, all of this goes into, well, it's relevant. It's relevant to what? It's relevant to 
trying to stay alive or it's relevant to having a kind of um, presentation that I want for various reasons. It gets into my identity. Again, this goes on and on and on and on and on and on. Right. And so the point is, in many different dimensions, we face combinatorial explosion. And what's um, what you can't do, and this is where it lines up with the must, because mm -hmm. we're finite beings yes. with finite resources and finite time, is you can't check all of that information. So you can't go and say, no, that's not relevant. That's not relevant. That memory is not relevant. That will take right, that's the, the rest of the history of the universe. <laughs> right, right, right. So, so we don't know how we do it, in fact, because of that in part. Well, I mean, I think we're, we're, I think there's getting some clues towards it, um, but we can talk about that later, okay. right? So um, the must and the prioritization on the perception side, you're fine with. It has to be. It has to be. And here, but here's the tricky thing, um, which is um, the fact that we can't check it means, and this sounds almost like a Zen Cohen, is the prioritization is odd uh, when you say it sort of like prima facie. Yeah, because it means we intelligently ignore most of the information. Right. So the prioritization- and, and, and that's huge. We intelligently ignore. When I walk into my office, I don't look at the mess that is my office. Now, some people, when they walk into my office, the one, they don't look at any particular aspect of the mess. They just see the mess. And they're like, wow. Yeah, it's kind of a mess. It's, well, after, after all the travel, gonna clean out the office. I take everything out of this room, take out the carpet, gonna redesign this whole office. I'm tempted to put it in another building, but we've had a bunch of break-ins, so now I'm not thinking about putting it. See, you notice it's just all of this going on all at the same time, that, that's just how we live our life. The, what I wanna put- Yeah, what yeah I that's, wanna, that's a good codicil. So you're saying that you don't wanna misinterpret the necessity for prioritization as are as something like the necessity or our now here's a funny thing about perception and attention i can't look at this anymore at, at some point a little later and i drew attention to it in a previous video there's someone sitting right over peugeot's shoulder right here let's see there's the little cursor it's showing up there right there that person is going to move their arm and what that was for me was kind of a, there's a person back there. Why is there a person back there? Now, you know, you got camera people there. You got sound people there. It's, you know, a lot of people have asked, well, will, will all of the things that I'm doing in Europe be recorded? I'd say, yeah, but I got to warn you, it's really hard to do sound well. Okay. And, you know, don't want to, you know, say anything bad against my lovely host from the Chicago estuary, but they struggled with sound, as a good number of you have pointed out. And so even though we sort of have this image that it's just Jordan and John and Jonathan talking in the room, there are other people in the room and they're trying to stay hidden. And there's probably a sofa or a chair. In fact, you see a sofa back there on the other side of, I don't know if that's a staircase. I've never been in that room, so I have no idea, but I think that's the top level of, of Jordan's house that he refitted with a bunch of these artifacts from his friend. But there's a person sitting back there and they're going to move their arm and it, bang, it's going to catch my attention and it's going to catch my attention. Um, it's going to now, now here, watch this word, distract me. Well, what is a distraction? A distraction is sort of like a weed. It's, it's something that I don't desire. So now we have another element of detention, of attention. It's, well, it's, it's playing somehow with my desires. Uh, sometimes I'm distracted by things that I, I, I want to be able to focus, to attend to something. And again, there's a lot of talk about this in the Ian McGilchrist video. I want to attend to something. And there's a distraction. And I can't pay attention to it when Jordan was at, um, I think, at that one place at, at Oxford. And there's the... The woman who was sitting right next to him, maybe the security guard, and she's doing this and doing that and doing that. I just, just kept paying attention. It was distraction. Our ability to make a numbered list of exactly. the number of possibilities that lay out in front of us, because that's actually impossible. Right. So, so that isn't how we do it. However, we do it isn't that exactly. So, when you, when, when, if, if, if you're okay with that reading, and it sounds like you are, prioritization doesn't mean what we normally mean by prioritization, where we set things out 
explicit and focal and then choose right between and, and conscious we prioritize unconsciously something is prioritizing our attention and that something isn't a thing and now it doesn't mean that we don't have um organs or portions of the brain or no in fact but but that thing is in fact connected to many many different things if you again look at let's say jared diamond's guns germs and steel he talks about the fact that when he would walk through the jungle with um, someone from papua new guinea who lived in the jungle the jungle is a very different place for that person from papua new guinea they see very different things than the person who grew up in a city now flip that around bring the person from Papua New Guinea into the city and have them walk with Jared Diamond, they're both going to be seeing different things. And their attention and the priority of their attention will be drawn to different things. Right. It it's implicit. It's implicit and right. it's self-organizing and our ability to think. And it's unconscious. It, yes, emerges yeah. out of yeah. it. We, yeah. are, we can influence it top down, but because it is an absolute requirement for our cognition, I would argue that our ability to do anything that we do consciously is ultimately dependent on it and presupposes right. it. Right. Okay, fine. So that's good. Now, how this connects to attention and self-directed attention, well, let's say you just have been living your life, eating whatever looked good or what you like to eat, so on and so forth, year after year after year, and the doctor comes along and says, Mm, things are not looking good. Well, what do you mean? So you're probably going to die before uh, we would expect you to die. Well, what do you mean? Well, what are you eating? Well, I, I eat this, this, and this. Well, don't eat that. Now, suddenly, the doctor has connected life and death with what you're eating and not eating, and you're going to have all different ideas about what you should and shouldn't eat, and things are going to look very different for you. Jonathan, you well, got anything I, to add I to that? I think the only thing that I would add is you have to phrase it in a certain way there's no you have to have a sentence but there's a sense in which perception when we say we must prioritize our perceptions i i think the best way to understand it is that perception is already prioritization it is to in order to perceive that there yeah, has that's to be and, and that's a really big point perception is already prioritization there's already selection going on hierarchy Wait, in itself yeah, yeah. The, perception is in and of itself it, an act of implicit prioritization. Yeah, imp right, yeah. and to like use that. the word implicit would be a good idea, so to avoid mm -hmm. the idea that we are consciously doing it, but that in order to even perceive the world, there already has to be a, a given hierarchy that is that is making you able to focus on anything, because yeah. or else we yeah. or else we would be lost in a in a wave, a, you know, a sea of infinite. And I don't know a lot about autism or other. Um, other disabilities, but it would seem that um, other disabilities, people have um, don't have the capacity to, let's think about it this way, to focus in community with each other. The ground squirrels around the church focus in community with each other. The dogs in your home focus in community with each other. They are not only have perception and attention in the world, they do that collectively. There's, in a sense, a collective cognition that is going on between the ground squirrels or the prairie dogs or the dogs in your home. They're participating in a network. Now, it's truly amazing because there's very little load, as it were, but to bring in the body language that Peugeot is, they, they already, the community of prairie dogs or the community of ground squirrels or the community of dogs, call them a pack, let's say, they already sort of form a body. And that body doesn't have two eyes. That body might have eight or 10 or 12 eyes. You say a body with 12 eyes. Yeah, a body with 12 eyes. And then they can go all different directions, but they can also collectively achieve a united sphere of attention. Now, in many ways, this is what happens in the body of the church. We achieve a collective, a collective cognition, collective attention, 
And now, in order to do this, well, dogs and prairie dogs and ground squirrels, they, they just go and do this. And if you sit and you watch them quite carefully, you'll learn some of the ways in which they do this. They don't do this consciously to the best of our degree. They certainly reinforce each other and, and, and discipline each other and, and have all sorts of layers in this, but this is what they do. And this is what we do. Uh, details. Okay, so I think that's a good codicil. And so we could also make a little technical case here quickly. So part of the problem that John, John referred to is that, in some sense, it's the problem of the finite confronting the infinite. And so we could make a neurological argument for that. So for example, when you move your eyes around or when they move around as a consequence of being directed by unconscious structures of prioritization. And, and don't forget, we've talked about before, the fact that your eyes are in fact always moving around. And the vision, I talked about my friend with low vision where I'd sneak up on him and poof, I just poof in like I dream of genie. Um, your, your eyes in fact are always sort of darting around because your eyes are creating this image that's in front of you and you think that this image is always available and now at this moment I can direct my attention to that old air conditioning unit that hasn't worked for 15 years on my wall but never bothered to take it down. The outside unit was taken away and so there it sits on my wall. That'll probably come down when if I if I completely redo my office, but again, almost anything in the office is like pay attention to. It's all sort of available to me, but why that and why not those papers on the wall or that plaque or that painting or that poster or these books or 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 Count Dracula, Count Chocula or or Kermit. No, that's not Count Chocula. That's just the Count from Sesame Street. So on and on and on and on, because that happens all the time. You move your eyes around because you want to direct the high resolution part of your visual system to whatever you're attending to. That's the fovea. And the fovea is a very small part of your retina. And it's a very high resolution part. So each cell in the fovea is connected at the level of the primary visual cortex to 10,000 cells. And then each of those have 10,000 connections. And so if your whole vision was foveal in its... Um, in its resolution, you'd have to have a skull like an alien to contain that much brain. And so, but now think about the collective consciousness of the prairie dogs, or the or the ground squirrels, or the the pack of dogs. Um, they they in fact have multiple brains, and in some ways, the their collective attention lives in the network. Just like in many ways in a church or even in a committee or a business or a family, the collective attention of the body lives in the, in the network between the people. So, so, and that's a real indication of that finitude, right? Is that you do have limited cognitive resources and limited means practically and physically limited, but it also means metabolically limited. The, the cost of running your brain is already extremely high. And, and so you're going to shepherd your available attentional resources because they are finite and, and they're finite in no small part because they are technically, metabolically costly. That now, this week I'm working on 1 Corinthians, the, the part just after the Thanksgiving. Now I exhort you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you say that you all say the same thing, and there not be divisions, um, schismata, among you, and that you may be made complete in the same mind and with the same purpose. And um, again, one of my one of my favorite exegetes, um, uh, Kenneth Bailey, has a nice little commentary on First Corinthians. And he talks about um, the that you may at all agree. Now that now that word has a particular meaning for us in English, but um, um, kat artizo. That's the that's that you may fit together. Now, now you you do like a Greek um, a Greek lexical search of the New Testament, and you discover that this is the mending of the nets that the disciples are doing. That this word isn't just that. Um, that you, oh, I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree. It's You have an image that the whole body comes together in some way like the collective 
my, the collective attention of the tribe or of the pack or of the ground squirrels or of the prairie dogs, but at a far higher level that in fact, it all becomes one body. Again, we might think of a team. And if let's say it's a basketball team and the and two of the players don't want to play with the other three players and they won't pass them the ball, well, you're not going to win games. And and so Paul is basically saying you need to end the divisions and you need to be knit together into this collective attention, consciousness. This is what you ought to be. That all seems okay. So I would add one thing to that, which is I, I would- and, and I would say even the process of these three having this conversation is an attempt to get at that kind of unity. Now it's of attention. We're going to talk about attention and Jordan is using this list of things to say, this is where we're going to draw our attention and we're sitting in a room and we're paying attention to each other and we're clothed in a certain way. Jordan and his classroom lectures would make the point that there's all sorts of things built into the classroom when the students come in there and they know where to sit and they know how to behave and they know what to do. There's, there's just so much that's built into that. And often you don't recognize that unless you, let's say, travel cross culturally. And, and, you know, basically even the act of listening to a lecture requires attention. Even the act of decoding language acquires attention. You learn this, let's say, if you're, let's say, if you're going to learn Koine Greek and you very quickly discover that, wow, word order varies quite dramatically from language to language. You don't think a thing of word order, you pay no attention to word order, but in your in the language that you grew up with, word order is an element of the language that you pay absolutely no attention to, but you can manage well. And now suddenly, if you draw attention to it, you can't do things. And there's a nice section in the I just don't have time to just jump between all of these clips right now because I've got to end at a certain time. But in fact, attention can get in the way. I've used the example of free throw shooting or shooting a basketball in general. You have to sort of let the formation take over of doing what you're doing, whether it's shooting a basketball or scoring a, a goal. Um, you have to let other elements in your own network manage the... And that's why you practice shooting a basketball. It's like, well, it isn't a matter of paying attention. Now, you might pay attention to your stance. You might pay attention to where your feet are. And that's why you get a basketball. Let's say a shooting coach will say, well, why don't you move your hands here? Why don't you move your hands here? Why do you do that funny thing with your arm? In other words, you, you can sort of deconstruct it with attention, but um, rhythm replaces strength. And at some point, you're going to get all that muscle memory in. But put an emphasis on how this process has to be self-organizing. Because we want to avoid uh, a perennial problem, which you and I both know shows up in psychology, which is to posit the internal homunculus yeah. that actually doesn't explain the problem, but just shifts it, the central. Yeah. And, and now the internal homunculus, if you watch John's Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, it's sort of the little man and sort of this little this homunculus, the man inside the man or the man inside the machine that's sort of moving the arms and doing all this. you get this problem of infinite regress. There's always another little man inside the little man. And the idea of this is that, well, all of our language presupposes in some ways the little homunculus. And in that way, the language preserves sort of this sacred agent within us. We'll say it that way. Or the sacred agent between us. I, I've often noted that in the New Testament church, if you read carefully, it's almost as if the Holy Spirit, Christians are talking the Holy Spirit within me, yes, but that's a spirit within your community and within your members. The Holy Spirit is, is between the people of the church, helping the people of the church become one body. And again, that's the New Testament language. Yeah. Executive is an example of this, etc. So we don't we we don't want to say that there's someone that's doing the prioritization because that someone is just as mysterious, right? And, and is facing the very problem that we're trying to explain. 
So yeah. right, the process yeah. has yeah. to be dynamically well, uh, self-organized. One, well, one of the ways I realized now, at some point, we're going to have to deal with the self-organizing because whereas on one hand, a lot of our language sort of trips into the homunculus issue, the self-organizing sort of trips into another issue, which is the, uh, there might in fact be a, a tiny little seed of the meaning crisis in that language itself because it's self-organizing. Oh, okay, it does it by itself. Oh, okay. Well, what does that mean? You've, you've in some ways shifted the homunculus to another self. Is, it, is that self a person? No. Then when you have to answer that question, you're going to have to say, is that, is that self itself just again, say a microcosm of the whole show? Simply a mechanism. Then that has implications. So, and, and that's very much going to come up on later in the conversation when they really um, get into narrative. How that problem works is in an attempt to solve the mind-body problem, because you can't solve the mind-body problem. But you can say, well, let's say you're, you want to uh, explore an idea, and you decide to do that by writing an essay. So then you sit down in front of the computer. Now, back to the self problem, because I didn't have to pay a lot of attention to what Jordan was saying right there, because I pretty much knew what, we, what he was going to say. And you think it's self-organizing tornado. Okay. And, and maybe the better word is spirit, the spirit of the tornado, because the spirit is the, is that which moves the tornado. Now, obviously a tornado in terms of complexity is nowhere near as complex as the formation of the filtering of combinatorial explosiveness, not only within my 59 years, but in the generation after generation after generation after generation, both individual and within bodies throughout history, right away the math just gets so complex it, it, it cannot be done. Which is not an idea. It's actually that you're sitting and then you move your fingers on the keyboard. And so there's a hierarchy of transformation from mind, which might be the abstract intent, to body. And so and so the, the spirit hits the body in the finger movements. And then the they, they just use spirit. Spirit disappears in some sense under the finger movements because you can move your fingers voluntarily, but you have no idea what muscles you're moving to do that. And you can't control the cells or anything like that. Oh, I, I did that with my students in the lecture this morning. I was talking about uh, this very fact that I said. Uh, and, and in fact, if you sometimes if you're trying to stop typing a word incorrectly, you will you have to pay attention to your fingers. Sometimes if you pay attention to your fingers in the wrong way, you you lose the capacity to, let's say, type quickly. If you take a typing test, you're not thinking about every each individual keystroke. You go into this little mini flow state, basically, and, and you're not even, let's say, reading the words consciously in your head. You're just, you're just going, and, and it's sort of like a spirit is being created, for, you know, and, and the spirit is accomplishing this, this act. Up your finger, okay? Bend your finger. What do you do to bend your finger? Right. Bend exactly. Finger. Exactly. Yeah. It's so interesting. <laughs> you, you spent the first year of your life doing this work. You did. It's so interesting <laughs> that you have that level of consciousness at that level of detail, which is pretty detailed, but no more than that. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that's a mystery, man. That 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 localization of consciousness between the body and part of the spirit there's like a there's like a what would you call it a there's a bandwidth there's a bandwidth of resolution for consciousness yes. and why that band see the social psychologists who studied language sort of caught on to this because one of the things they realized was that short words first of all short words tend to be old words yes so mm -hmm. because as language develops words that are used a lot get more efficient but the short words also map extraordinarily well onto the self-evident level of perception. 
And so, for example, a short word is cat because a cat presents itself for some reason to our perception. The species cat doesn't, and the the fur of the cat in some sense doesn't. It's the cat. Yes. And and you can see that primary object rec level recognition. Basic I think level. Is I, I can't remember what I was reading two days ago about this, where maybe it might have been in a comment because you guys leave such good comments. You know, a, a child can recognize a cat. You know, it's that gestalt. Um, it's the the man who 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 mistook his wife for a hat. It's what it's what that man has lost, and what the what the what the small child has. What in fact even the simple can manage. Well, basic rush. level. That's yeah, right. Rush, yes, basic yes, level. yes, yes. And so you see that with babies because they get doggy pretty damn fast, and that bec that's because the language maps onto the primary domain of perception, that basic level perception quite nicely. And that is associated with something like the natural bandwidth of consciousness. Yeah, I, I, I would I would say that that lines up with, if you if Rush's explanation is, you know, you're getting the best trade-off between differences between category and similarities within category. Right, and then the question is, what does best trade-off mean? Exactly, and that's, and, and for me, that's, that's what, that would that be a little bit of, um, I, I guess, a nuance I'd want to put onto uh, the prioritization, because the prioritization sounds very much sort of like an imposition, whereas I think what we're talking about is something more like what Marl T Ponty talked about when he talked about optimal gripping, mm -hmm. right? So yep, what, what, bet, what's, what's the correct you know, distance to look at this? Well, it depends, because if I zoom in, I lose the gestalt. If I yeah. zoom out, I lose the detail. Yeah, it depends on when, what you want to do. Exactly. Yes, well, that, well exactly. that's it. That's why I'm kind of attracted to pragmatism. It's like, well, to some degree, our theories of truth need to be embedded in the practicalities of action. And so, is that a grippable object that I can drink from? Well, I want my perception to match that problem. Yeah, but the, it doesn't, I think that it, if you understand that the prioritization, let's say that you have heaven and earth, I'm gonna use, sorry, I'm gonna use mythical categories, but so you have, That's you, fine. Well, <laughs> you, have, you, have you have heaven and earth and that, it's the way in which heaven meets earth is a is a mutual relationship, right? We always see it as a relationship of lovers, you could say. So it's not the the prioritization isn't just about an imposition from above, but it's about the manner in which that which is above, let's say the the, the hierarchy, is able to encounter the potential well, in which it's. We were talking about that last night. So Jonathan made this funny joke last night. We were talking about Sam Harris, and Sam Harris has this uh, line of argumentation where. And he used this on me where I interpreted a biblical story and then he interpreted a recipe. Yes. And he I, said, I've well, look at all the interpretations. And that is a problem of... of Semiotic drift. Yes. Exactly. Well, it's also a problem of this horizon of infinite possibility. There yes. are multiple in yes. interpretive schemes. Yes. So Jonathan said he'd like to do a video where he shows that a recipe is actually necessarily embedded inside a mythological framework. And we started to talk about that because imagine, well, the, re the recipe implies that you need to make an edible meal, that you want to make an edible meal, that you're going to serve it to family and friends, that that's part of a kind of communion, that you think that's a good thing that's worth spending time on, that serves your family and friends, that's maybe nested in something like an ethic of service to the community. Like, there's a whole, there's a whole network of purpose. You can see that gets very religious very quickly. I would add more to that. It, it, there, there's all kinds of implicit assumptions that I can capture in a sequence of propositions procedural skills that are not completely capturable in words, and that those procedures and skills can also map on to the particular virtues and skill, uh, uh, you know, that, that people are bringing to it. Like, it's like, most things can't be solved by a recipe. And right. Yet, right? And yet, so a recipe is a significant cognitive cultural achievement. And we don't recognize like, and, 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 we, 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 we tend to overgeneralize the things we think for which we can provide recipes. This is one mm -hmm, of the- right. this is That's an the, algorithm issue. Yes, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots. Yeah. But even in the recipe itself, you will notice that the way in which we name things and the way in which we order things will be related to a, a normal prioritization, hierarchy prioritization. But if you're making chicken- Which is, which is exactly right. If you've ever read a recipe or followed a recipe, look at what's at the beginning of the recipe and look what comes towards the end. Part of it might be procedural, but usually again, you have a list of ingredients and look at the order of the list of ingredients. They don't list the, the, the tiny amounts of spice first usually unless 
let's say the book in which the recipe is found is how to cook with, let's say, cinnamon. You'll have the chicken and then you'll have the spices. And you'll understand that these elements that I'm adding are spices and that they're, they're let's say, something like a marginalia that I'm adding to the central meal. Yeah. It's, it's actually the very, it's like it's the pattern of a church, actually, you know, where you have a, a movement towards the central identity that we understand. And then we have the way in which it's complemented to other things. And so even the well, actual and, and so, well, recipe itself well, is like and, a little and, microcosm. And also the and, and then you have, in a sense, the community, the body that's created of people who make, let's say, cinnamon chicken. That doesn't sound good at all. Um, th that you make chicken dishes, okay? And and now that's a very, it's a very strange body and it only pops up now and then and probably in fairly specialized places, but judgment you use is like, well, how much spice? Yeah. Well, the answer is, well, what function is the spice going to serve? And you say, well, I want to let, add a little zest and interest to my cooking. And so then you have a philosophy of zest and interest that's associated with that because just predictable chicken isn't good enough. And maybe you want to put a little more spice on because you want to, uh, what would you say? You want to uh, challenge your guests a little bit yeah. in an interesting way. And you're thinking this all through. And For the same reason you'd wear funny socks or a tie that has just a little bit too much on it, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. that's actually a future of general problem solving. Like you, when people are solving a problem, especially if they might get the wrong frame, moderately distracting you from the central concern is an optimal way. To yeah, exactly. Insight. You need to do that. So, so what I'm hearing both of you say is, the prioritization is really a multi-dimensional optimal gripping. Mm -hmm. they're, they're that's right. That's right. Again, and, and John's nicely drawing a sort of back to the thesis and the, the article. We're talking about attention and what emerges in a community. And again, the, the community isn't even terribly self-aware of what's happening. And you might say that there are spirits at work in that community is that the community is seeking an optimal grip. All right, this community is seeking to to optimize. Now, optimize according to what? Now, there'll be varying, um, competing values at play. But even all of those values at play are also nested and sitting within an economy and a context and an arena that is shaping those. Well, we want to maximize chicken use. No chicken go unpotted, something like that. We're okay. constantly trading up. Okay, well then we can also expand on that to some degree because multidimensional and optimal brings a lot of other concerns into it. So imagine that one of the principles, and, and Kant, Kant mm. moved towards this with his theory of universal ethic in some sense, although I think, it, you know, I hesitate to criticize Kant, because, but I, I think that there's a deeper explanation for what he observed is, well, how should I treat you? Well, that's a complex question, but one of the constraints is, well, what if we meet a hundred times? So we're gonna establish an actual relationship. So however I conduct myself in the present moment has to be in accordance with a value hierarchy that takes into account the desirability of our mutual interrelationship into the future. Mm -hmm. And that produces a very serious series of, I would say, and, and this gets into the formation of bodies. Often intrinsic constraints. So I can't be too insulting. I can't be too unwelcoming. I have to offer you something approximating a true reciprocity for the thing not to degenerate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, and all of that, and I would say that also governs how you cook for someone if you yeah. actually want to make friends. So it's like treat other people as you would like them to treat you. Yeah. And Freddy, there, Freddy, Freddy's golden rule. Uh, almost, you know, after in the Freddie and Paul show, Nancy, if Nancy's on the show, Nancy will give a, um, a little sermon summary. And it's, it's always fascinating for me to hear what she pulls out of the sermon. It can be humbling as a preacher because I think, well, here are the main points that I want people to walk away from. And when she is regurgitating the sermon or giving a summary of the sermon, a report on the sermon with her own little uh, sermonic twist that Nancy usually likes to bring in. That's, you know, it's, it's amazing to hear what comes out, the relevance realization that's gone on in Nancy's head. Now, what Jordan just said is almost after every sermon, 
Freddie, what was the sermon? What was today's sermon about? Treat people the way you want to be treated. Boom. It just, just lays it down every time. Is every one of my sermons about that? Well, that's probably somewhere in it someplace, but... It's pretty funny that that's the intrinsic ethic in a recipe, and so that's a good, that's a, that's such a funny argument. Let's see, let's see now I'm, I'm watching who's ever back there. Some, something's moving, something's moving, and again, my eye gets caught, my eye gets drawn to it. We'll get right back to Jonathan. Oh, no, 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 So it's kind okay. of a correlate or presupposition to act in the world. So it's kind of a correlate or the first or something equivalent to act in the world. We must prioritize our actions. I don't think we probably have to cover no, that, right? I, because I, it's, it's perception already. is a, an action already. Because yes. you have to move your eyes and orient your head. And uh, also so, gripping is an action. Yes, exactly. Right. So I think that goes with it. Right yeah. Right. Okay. So, so we'll leave that. Well, okay. Now this is the next, this is a nice switch. I think any system of priorities is a structure of values. And then I sneak something in an ethic. So I'm kind of defining ethic as a something approximating perhaps an internally. All right, I'm going to stop here because I have to go. But yeah, I'm, I'm running out of week. Today's Tuesday. I don't know how much of this I'm going to get through before I go to Europe. And obviously, I'm not going to do commentary videos when I'm in Europe. I'm going to be my attention is going to be drawn to. Oh, all the new things that I'll see, all the new people I'll meet. All the new experiences I'll have. Never been to Europe before, so this is exciting. Um, and yeah, we'll see. So anyway, that's that's enough for now.